thank you very much. Uh, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to to speak with you. And um, I have sent you a little bit of preliminary material to make it easier. Of course, it would be most most agreeable if, if we were all together in person, but we're all pretty used to this routine now. So I'll try to make it as my, my, my talk as clear as possible. I, I've sent along an outline um, in lieu of a PowerPoint, which I confess to being somewhat incompetent to manage uh, adequately um, or elegantly at least. Uh, so I, I will be following along that that outline um, and en embellishing a bit as I go. Uh, basically, I'm going to try to summarize at least the main the main spine of the argument of the little book, uh, the politics of beauty. Um, and I should say that I'm my my original exposure to Kant as an academic exposure as a college student, for what it's worth, was in a course on romantic. Uh, and I was assigned the, the the paper, the presentation on Kant on the sublime. So that was where my my introduction to Kant, and perhaps it's corrupted me ever since. That in a way, the core of my interest in Kant may may derive from that from that experience. But this was the first time I had really turned to the critique of judgment, particularly the critique of aesthetic judgment, uh, in an intensive way, and. Uh, for, for a number of reasons. Partly I was giving a course. I mean, for many of us, we, we give a course and then we get we get interested and decide to write something. Um, but also because the the the, uh, the the whole issue of aesthetics and politics seems to be, uh, I won't say perennial because it, it probably doesn't go back all that long in, in terms of the history of philosophy, this, given that the very topic or our term aesthetics is a relatively recent one. But that certainly the theme of the relationship between, say, poetry and politics, or uh, and particularly in our era between the media and politics, uh, seems to be an ever more complex and fraught one. So that was that was one reason, and the second reason was that there seemed to be when I began to delve into the text and and the secondary literature, a basic disagreements about the very meaning of the uh, of the art, you know, what the argument was. And uh, with very specific uh, questions that seem to be to go unresolved. And it, it struck me that by looking at this rather narrow dimension, which is by no means a comprehensive way of approaching the critique of, of aesthetic judgment, nevertheless, that one really received a kind of enlightenment, illumination on, on key points, and in particular, the relationship between natural beauty and artistic beauty, a much debated topic in Kant's studies, and also the normative force of judgments of taste. Are they more like epistemological judgments? Are they more like moral judgments? Uh, and again, no, no decisive reading. It seemed to me that the that that this political focus shed shed significant light on that that issue as well. Um, so let me let me just sort of run through the basic argument. I will be leaving out big chunks. Uh, there's a, a long discussion. Cover right now, but I'd be happy to talk about it later if you if you like. So let me let me just start and um, and begin with what I'd, I'd like to call the problem of taste. Kant taste is a problem, and that problem has a theoretical dimension and a practical dimension. Uh, beginning with the, the theoretical dimension. Um, Kant starts with a, a kind of conceptual analysis of, of what we mean when we call something beautiful. And he describes four elements or moments, and by moments, I think he means something like criteria um, that guide our judgment of taste in a way analogous to the way objective judgments, cognitive judgments are guided by the, the table of categories. And accordingly, he, he he organizes it around uh, the four the four central uh, concepts of quality, quantity, relation, and, and modality. Uh, turning to the quality of, of ju such judgments, he calls them subjective. Uh, they are they are matters of pleasure and not cognition. They register a kind of feeling, but it's a feeling of a particular kind. He calls it disinterested pleasure. Uh, second, under the category of quantity, he, he 
he says, well, there's something universal about our judgments of taste. When we, when we say something is beautiful, we somehow expect others to agree with us, uh, almost as if it were an objective judgment when we say it's raining out, but, but, and yet it's subjective, not objective. Relationally, he, he says the judgments of taste register or uh, are, are determined by um, the, uh, the, the perception of, or, or the apprehension in some way of what he calls purposiveness without purpose. Things, a kind of harmony that does not have an end that could be expressed in terms of a determinate concept of some kind. Uh, so for example, you can you can find a rose beautiful without knowing that it's a rose or even that it's a flower. It doesn't in any way detract from your aesthetic judgment of its beauty to not know what it is. Uh, so so it's, it's somehow independent of uh, the conceptual determination, this is a rose. Um, and finally, there's uh, their modality. And he says that, that judgments of taste uh, lay claim to a kind of necessity. Um, but what what kind of necessity becomes becomes a kind of a question. So under the heading of uh, purposiveness without purpose, to 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 backtrack a bit, um, he says, what would explain the kind of harmony that would arise without the constraint of rules, that is dependence on a concept of what the object is to be. And he describes it as a, a kind of free harmony between imagination and understanding of this, a harmony similar to that involved in, in cognition, except that it's free rather than constrained by rules. And then turning finally to the necessity involved in judgments of taste, um, insofar as it lays claim to necessity, it requires, there must be some a priori principle at work and therefore there, there needs to be some a, a deduction of some kind. So that's the that's the sort of the lay of the land vis-a-vis -vis the elements or moments of of judgments of 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 beauty or taste, the two being for him equivalent. <laughs> and this gives rise to an immediate puzzle. How is a judgment of taste even possible, given the evident tension between subjectivity and universality? A subjectivity which we ordinarily associate with empiricism and therefore nothing universal or at least necessary and universality, which we ordinarily associate with kind of aesthetic rationalism. And so he's going to try to resolve that question. But there's also a practical dimension to the problem of taste. Um, I'm calling it the Rousseau problem because I think that's somewhat the way Kant himself saw it. And I would draw your attention to the first quotation um, that I, in, in, do, does everybody have a copy of the handout? Let me let me just take a yes that you is that is that in hand and by the way I apologize for not sending the German quotations but I figured that would be easier for you to look up in your own ed editions which I'm sure you have readily available uh, than for me <laughs> to to try to send you the uh, an electronic version um, so turning to that um, he 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 speaks of. Um, uh, in, in quotation one, if we grant that the urge to society is natural to man, but that his fitness and propensity for its that is sociability is a requirement of man as a creature with vocation for society, and hence is a property pertaining to its humanity. In other words, there must be something good about our sociability. Um, it's a natural urge that we have, um, you know, in general, well and good, but there's a problem when civilization, he goes on to say, has reached its peak. It makes this communication, which is initially facilitated by our judgments of the beautiful, almost the principal activity of refined inclination. And sensations are valued, and here I think is the key, almost the principal activity of refined inclination. And, and sensations are valued only to the extent that they are universally communicable. At that point, even if the pleasure in each person has in such an object is inconsiderable, is almost negligible, um, uh, and of no significant interest in its own, think you know Trump's, <laughs> you 
Trump's picture circulating, or even the the uh, the Hearst picture that I that I included. I mean, how interesting is that? All these random polka dots. Yeah, it's nice, but not not that great. It's not Beethoven's ninth, you know. Um, its value was increased almost infinitely by the idea of its universal um, communicability. And at that point, he says. No matter how refined this inclination may be, the interest will also easily fuse it with all the other inclinations and passions that reach their greatest variety and highest degree in society. In other words, at a certain point, the refinement of taste becomes particularly um, open to corruption or to merging or to being melted down with uh, all the, vi the vices of, of civilization. And therefore it's no wonder that as Rousseau insisted in the first discourse, famously, uh, the more you know, the more refined taste becomes, the more, the more corrupt <laughs> societies generally grow, and the more unhappy uh, people generally uh, become. So, I think what what Kant is trying to do is to save civilization uh, by, re by reforming taste through a, a kind of critical uh, reappraisal and correction. That's the, that's that's what I basically think is going is going on, at least at a political level in 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 the book. So um, okay, so so what is his solution? Well, here there are at least two basic elements. The, the the first element, I'm calling it critical, and this is number Roman numeral two on the outline. Critical solution one is a deduction. And but it's a deduction, and this is at section 38 specific, and, and, and critics, I think, often miss this fact, and we could argue about it, the deduction of beauty at 38 only applies to natural beauty, and indeed to what he calls free beauties of nature. Simple shapes, shells, blossoms, uh, things like that. Um, and the deduction at 38, he says, proves to be relatively easy. And, and let me go through three, three aspects of the deduction. Firstly, uh, the deduction of the necessitating claim to be, to 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 you know that that flower or that thing over there is beautiful and and others should agree with that. I can expect others to agree with that. Uh, why? Because it appeals, Kant says, to the same idea of common sense or shared capacity to bring imagination and understanding into harmony that also underlies the communicability of objective knowledge though with the additional proviso that the harmony between imagination and understanding, which is required for cognition, in this case arises freely and without dependence on what the on a concept of what the object is to be, and therefore with this peculiar pleasure, which is a, basically a feeling of the mutual enlivening of imagination and understanding. But, and this is the second element I think to stress, <laughs> again, the deduction at 38 only applies to judgments of free beauties of nature. Say, the rose is beautiful versus Homer is beautiful. So what about ju judgments like Homer is a, is a great poet? The, the, the work of Shakespeare is beautiful. The work of uh, Mozart is beautiful. Um, how do we justify those kinds of, of statements? And there's an anticipatory clue provided at sec in section 22. And this would be the second quotation on the handout. So what is this common sense to which um, judgments of taste appeal? Is it a constitutive principle of the possibility of experience as in the deduction at 38? Or is there still a still higher principle of reason that makes it only a regulative principle for us? Is taste, in other words, original and natural ability that we all share from day one? Or is taste only the idea of an ability yet to be acquired, a, poss a possibility of reaching such agreement? So that ju the judgment of taste would only offer an example of the application of this principle. So here are two ways of thinking about judgments of taste. Uh, and he doesn't yet, he doesn't hear resolve the, he doesn't answer the question. And indeed, some scholars like Paul Geyer treat it as if he never gets around to it. But I, I, I would, I think he absolutely does get around to answering that question and answering it decisively. 
So that means that we have to turn to, 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 to artistic beauty, and this is Roman numeral three. And, and artistic beauty presents a special problem. Why? Well, just on the face of things, there's a theoretical issue. Um, firstly, as we've seen, to find something beautiful is to find it purposeless without purpose. It's to somehow make a judgment about it, uh, indicating a certain kind of beauty, a certain feeling that you have um, that presupposes non-conceptuality. It can't be dependent on concept because then the imagination would be constrained rather than free. On the other hand, you can't consider it a work of art without regarding it as being intentional. If somebody made it and they had something in their in mind and they had a concept in mind of what they wanted it to be. So how is it even possible to judge something to be both beautiful and a work of art? And Kant provides a, a conceptual resolution, or you could say the condition of the very possibility of artistic beauty or judgment of, of taste applying to a work of art, understood by the judge but to, to be a work of art, um, is what he calls genius, uh, which is a natural talent for the production of intuitions um, that involves concepts, but in other words, a general concept, a poet says, I'm going to write a poem, but the actual concept that is is kind of pull, pulling him along and that he's seeking to explicate is not exactly a determinate concept in the usual sense, but what he calls an aesthetic idea, something which has no rule behind it and which is uh, which is an expression, a, in a way, creation of, or, or at least a, something produced by imagination that extends beyond the limits of understanding, and therefore not only involves the harmony of understanding and imagination, as in the case of Free Beauties of Nature, but also what Kant calls spirit, Geist, that comes up out of the sublime, um, that brings reason also into motion. So in other words, to find an object of, uh, to judge an art, something to be beautiful and a work of art, particularly if it's what he calls uh, exemplary work of art, great work of art, is, is involves a kind of higher, higher harmony of the faculties involving not only imagination and understanding, but also somehow reason. Um, so that's a, we'll see that's a plus. Now to be sure genius must uh, is you know, the, the untutored genius isn't enough. You need the genius must acquire taste in order to be able to choose the right aesthetic attributes, as Kant puts it, for his ideas. So that genius, in the full sense, um, requires something like talent. You know, the talent of genius plus education. Plus, and the education doesn't mean necessarily going to art school, but it does mean probably being exposed to other great works of art from which you don't you don't copy but which you 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 from which you you learn something about the, the characteristics that make an, an aesthetic idea communicable to others and you can find I won't I won't stop here to to read it but you can find his 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 sort of his definitive definition of of genius um on uh page uh, 5317 if you if you want to look it up and as an illustration although it's not, not a very you know, <laughs> impressive one um, of what he means by an aesthetic attribute and going by an example that he himself gives uh, illustration one uh, which shows a, a sketch of, of Jupiter but Jupiter as an eagle and you see these arrows and lightning and these are what Kant calls aesthetic attributes, which run along behind or a, along with a, a concept of Jupiter, which somehow conjures up some broader notion of creation, of power, all of which ultimately uh, brings reason itself into motion, although not directly and not explicitly. So that's something like what he means by, uh, by, 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 by the production of genius. Um, on the other hand, Kant is not very forthcoming in the critique of judgment, but he doesn't give as many examples of what he thinks exemplar of, of what he considers exemplary art, uh, work of art. And the one the one example he gives at length, which he never calls it exemplary, is a rather 
uh, mediocre verse of Frederick the Great. <laughs> so why doesn't he talk about what he finds exemplary? Perhaps he doesn't want to influence us and, and wants to awaken our own critical powers. But because elsewhere, he certainly talks about what he finds exemplary. Milton, for example, is a great favorite of, of, of Kant. But in any case, um, and two more points under the general heading of what of genius. Um, it's not enough to be for art to be. Well, there's a difference between art, beautiful art that's exemplary, that really moves us fully and comprehensively and awakens reason in us, uh, and the merely tasteful. So, for example, Milton is one thing, but a pot by Wedgwood can be tasteful. It's a work of art. It's tasteful. In that limited sense, it's beautiful, but it's not an exemplary work of fine art, of schöne Kunst. Uh, and then finally, he talks about rhetoric as, in a way, fine art's evil cousin, but I don't want to go into that at length here, um, and I'd be happy to discuss it later. Okay, so the, the upside of, of artistic beauty, especially exemplary artistic beauty, is that it's more capable of withstanding the attractions of sensual pleasure. Uh, than other forms of beauty. For example, Kant gives the, the example of a person with refined taste who abandons a fancy gallery where there's all kinds of art up on the walls and people are chit-chatting and drinking champagne and whatnot, and turns away from that and goes outside and 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 stares you know, rhapsodically at the stars. Uh, um, because you know, refined taste, if it's merely tasteful, isn't that impressive. But I think the the, the 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 his intention is to suggest that if it were a Beethoven concert, you know, at its best, or uh, somebody was reading Milton really really impressively, uh, that person wouldn't perhaps have left the the the, the room. Um, the downside to artistic beauty, namely, that the taste is no longer original, natural; it must be acquired. Not not everybody enjoy. I mean, you know, not everybody can enjoy Homer. You have to know Greek, or you have to know something about the Greeks, <laughs> and therefore the universality and necessity of judgments of taste, and hence the very possibility of a principle of taste becomes new. In the case of roses and shells, contestable both theoretically and practically. Also. There, it becomes possible to have bad taste, um, which isn't, you know, every everyone, all children find roses attractive. So this is an enemy of taste, um, which has a theoretical um, On the one hand, the taste isn't based on concepts because otherwise there's settled through objective proof, which is manifestly not the case. The other side being that the judgment of taste is based on concepts, because otherwise you couldn't even argue about taste. And so that's one, that's, that's how do you settle that? How do you show that your principle of taste applying to objects, to work of art, is even possible? And practically, historically, this dispute takes a takes a kind of political form, especially as the classes the, the be, become more mixed. You know, the, the, the people from the country mingle with people in the city, the rubes with the, the and the rube defensive reasons is inclined to who hasn't had a chance to acquire good taste, inclined to claim that everyone has his own taste. While the athlete, realizing that he can't convince the rube that you know, Homer is wonderful. Can't argue about case and sort of gives up the project altogether. And the upshot is to that it, that um, this this dispute, both theoretical and practical, impedes the reciprocal communication that made the ancient republics possible. And there's a kind of striking claim on Kant's part, which I quote in uh, quotation number A. If you uh, turn to that, um, he says, and again, looking just at the 
the emphasized sentences, which are my emphasis, not Kant's. There were people during one age who strong urge to, to have sociability under laws, through which a people become a commonwealth, wrestled with the great problems, found the difficult task of combining freedom and health equality, constraint. constraint based more on respect and submission from duty than on fear. A people at such an age had to begin, had to begin, by discovering the art of reciprocal communication of ideas between its most educated and ruder citizens. Or by, that is by discovering how to make the improvement and refinement of the first harmonized with the natural simplicity and original um, of the second. Uh, so that was the that was the precondition of solving the political problem for them was stumbling on this discovery, uh, which was a basically a kind of aesthetic discovery that enabled the upper and lower classes to communicate in a way that was mutually productive. And uh, he then goes on to say that in future ages, uh, people will hardly be able to form a concept of the happy combination of one and the same people of the government constraint by culture uh, with the force of a free nature that feels its own value. Um, so, in a way, that the, the you know, I, I would say that that the pro the ultimate problem is how to reconstitute on a higher level uh, the reciprocal communication between the lower and the higher orders, which are really not lower and higher in Kant's in Kant's understanding, um, uh, on a on an enlightened on a critically enlightened basis. So this brings me to the critical solution too, uh, not his resolution of the antinomy at 38, but now overcoming the antinomy over the principle of taste. And here I'm just going to rush through. It's a, it's a very complicated argument, but the resolution proves to rest on hope, as he puts on 5, 538 of the Academy edition, based on an indeterminate concept of what can be regarded as uh, the supersensible substrate of humanity. And um, the result is an idea of common sense as something to be produced by us, what he had called for in 722. That's a regular principle of taste whose acquisition is guided by humanity's higher ends. In other words, the the, the, the antinomy can be resolved on both a theoretical and practical level if people share a kind of hope based on this indeterminate concept of the sub, supersensible substrate of humanity, that ultimately agreement is somehow possible. In short, hope of eventually coming into agreement about taste, which is what is required if productive co communication is going to occur, rests on a kind of maybe, an indeterminate concept for which no corresponding object can be given in advance. And uh, this turns this this allows us to, to, to quick to go finally to uh, exemplary beauty um, as a symbol of morality that therefore because there's something merely ideal about judgments of taste as Kant puts it that is that they're not grounded in an objective reality um, and therefore they can't on their own testify to the reality of the supersensible substrate that in a way their the hope is based upon. Exemplary beauty is a symbol of morality that looks out toward morality, say toward the kingdom of ends, but not but without aiming at it directly. As I say, once beauty aims directly at morality, it ceases to be beautiful. It becomes didactic. It's no longer purpose of enough without purpose. But it, it sort of intimates, it points toward, it looks out toward um, morality, providing an intellectual interest, as he puts it, in the acquisition of common sense of the more demanding type, not the kind everybody's born with, but the kind that must be acquired, uh, that we ourselves as a species have to bring into being. Um, and that leads finally to um, his, his return to the question of, um, of, of aesthetic judgment in, in part two, the judge, teleological judgment I'm saying in the, in the beautiful. And this would be number C on the, on, the, on the outline because somehow we need more. We need 
something more than this idea, this ideal <laughs> resolution to, to, to somehow beef up our hope in eventually coming into agreement about taste. And that requires a teleological judgment and its critique. And I won't go into detail into what, what happens there. Uh, it's obviously long complex. It involves, interestingly enough, his, his treatment of the relationship between religion and politics and, and many other interesting themes as well that bear on politics. But let me just um, give two, two uh, corollaries of his treatment of beauty at the end of his the, the critique of teleological judgment. One is he, he moves beyond a social sociability, the famous formula that he had invoked in his little essay, The Idea for a Universal History, um, and that everybody knows, um, but which leave, left things somewhat up in the air, as he, again, famously puts it there. We have much cultural, civilized, perhaps too much civilized, but as for being moralized, much is lacking. And yet without that, all, all of history, all of so-called progress is nothing more than during misery, as we might have might have agreed. And I want to claim that he, he refines that formulation in the critique of judgment and provides some further details as to how you can get from civilization to moralization. And that the key, at least in the critique of judgment, hinges on aesthetic judgment. And in particular, on a new understanding of uh, the possibilities and uh, limits of what he calls discipline, which in the critique of pure reason, which had denied the possibility of an a priori principle of taste, um, discipline is mainly a check on, on, the, on, on the freedom of imagination. In, in the critique of judgment, discipline becomes an expression of the freedom of imagination. And I would happy to... Uh, pursue that further, um, but it's uh, it, I've sort of indicated um, where that happens at, on uh, in fi the final quotation, quotation uh, uh, number four, and I'll just read briefly from that. Hence only culture can be the ultimate purpose that we have cause to attribute to nature with respect to the human species. Um, and then he goes on to say this other condition could be called the culture of discipline. Now, in the critique of, of pure reason, he opposes culture and discipline. But now discipline becomes the second equally important branch of culture. Um, but in this regard, we find and then he goes on to explain some of the difficulties. And then he goes on to say, no, I cannot dispute the preponderance of evils at the refinement of our taste to the point of its idealization. And even the luxury of treating sciences as food for our vanity, shower on us by producing in us so many insatiable inclinations. So we're back to the problem he had presented earlier, uh, call it the Rousseau problem. For we have the fine arts on the side, but um, for we have, uh, be, but, but, but we also, he says, cannot fail to notice that nature uh, within us pursues the purpose of making room for the development of our, ha our harmony our humanity, for we have the fine arts and the sciences, which involve a universally communicable pleasure, as well as um, elegance and refinement, and so prepare mankind for a sovereignty in which reason alone is to dominate. So again, I don't have time to go into the details, but but the idea here is that there's a kind of, he has a, a more complex, nuanced, dialectical, if you like, understanding of discipline, uh, that is enabled by his discovery of an a priori principle of taste, which is also the a priori principle of judgment itself, whose very possibility he had denied in his critique in the earlier critique. Um, and so that's a that's a very broad uh, outline of the basic the basic arg my basic argument in this little book. So a final, a final note, the potential relevance today. Well, I would say that one chief obstacle to, um, to uh, sort of the, 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 the productive interaction of aesthetics and politics in our own time has something to do with idealization 
and uh, the emergence ever more powerful of the valuation of art solely for the idea of its universal communicability. Uh, a, a process that arguably has gone much further than even Kant might have imagined possible. Um, and again, I, the, the images of Trump, you know, the, the, how, many, how many millions he's raising with that, with that image, which is a value only in a way because everybody will want it or enough people will want it that, that it, 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 it becomes a, a value. It's actual artistic interest is arguably and not just arguably quite minimal. And the same might be say for Damien Hirst's uh, work, The Currency, uh, which of which he made multiple copies, partly uh, in some in some very crude sense, handmade. He then he made ten thousand. He destroyed the then he destroyed the originals. He also made crypto chain versions, and um, and 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 so on. And and you know, obviously he's commenting in some in some broad way about the the, the commodification of of fine art, but. Uh, we seem to be stuck at this point and art doesn't se seem to be going much further or have or un have anywhere to go uh making something like the aesthetic education that Kant was talking about seem ever more remote particularly given that the classical models that he ho hoped might fill you know jump in and fill the breach seem to be ever less accessible to, to people. Uh, and, and so I would just conclude by saying that from a Kantian point of view, we must find new ways of furthering reciprocal communication between the contemporary equivalent of the educated and on the one hand and the original and natural on the other, or in Aristotle's terms, between the many and the few. Uh, for Kant, the, there's a very powerful analogy between popular art and, and refined art on the one hand and, and the elements of genius, uh, original and natural in one case, uh, but educated in the other. And I think in a way the history of perhaps uh, romantic, romantic, the romantic political and, and aesthetic movements of the 19th century uh, where it was understood that if you wanted to build a strong Republican nation, you had to somehow draw on the native uh, freedom loving um, originality of the people, but somehow refine it and channel it through through uh, through the educated classes. That was that was in a way a Kantian uh, a Kantian idea, although it's not often attributed to Kant, and perhaps there. Perhaps that obviously had great dangers, but perhaps we've not yet discovered uh, an adequate substitute. So I'll, I'll leave it there. And perhaps you have ideas about where where art could be taken in politically productive ways uh, at this at this point of of our <laughs> of our civilization, <laughs> increasing increasing the descent into into um, into barbarism. By, 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 I think by Kantian, by Kantian lights at least.